the Joan Quinn Profiles. As an editor for Andy Warhol's interview, the Los Angeles Herald Examiner, LA Style, and Detour Magazines, Joan covered the social set, the Hollywood hotshots, the international art scene, the mysteries of food, the excitement of travel, and the fabulous world of fashion. Joan continues to find creative people on the cutting edge who make things happen. Here's Joan Agajanian Quinn. Hi, I'm Joan Quinn, and welcome to the Joan Quinn Profiles. Waiting to be profiled are actor, author, Jack Klugman, and singer-performer Kevin Early. Three-time Emmy Award winner Jack Klugman, the youngest of six children, was born and raised in Philadelphia. He always wanted to act, but after two years at Carnegie Tech in Pittsburgh, where they told him he should be a truck driver, he left. <laughs> Jack found small roles, he did summer stock, and he debuted in 1959 on Broadway in Gypsy with Ethel Merman. In the 50s, 60s, and 70s, he worked in TV and film. He's best known to all of us as Oscar Madison in the TV series The Odd Couple, which was produced by our favorite, Gary Marshall. Oh, <laughs> we love him. And he played opposite Tony Randall. You were nominated for a Tony Award opposite yeah. Ethel Merman in Gypsy, but did you ever get a word in? No. <laughs> I, my voice was a lot better then than it is now, but it wasn't much better. In fact, uh, I had a moment where I say, uh, uh, Wayne Rose, well, you know, and I used to say, ah, Rose. And uh, Stephen Sondheim was imitating me at parties. So I said, Stephen, I don't appreciate you going to parties and making fun of me. He said, no, no, I'm not making fun of you. I wish I could do it the way you did. <laughs> That's why you got your Tony. <laughs> I, did, I did a reel. Oh, my audition was terrible for that. But that must have been pretty exciting. Oh, I loved her. That was your big break, kind of, Broadway Yeah, break? well, I did a lot of television and yeah, Johnny, Johnny Mercer came saw me once at a party he said holy mackerel I haven't seen you on television for half an hour oh that was great but did you sing were you a song and no, dance no no I did kiss me Kate with <laughs> Alfred Drake I did a time so on television but I can't you sing. can't sing but actually did you take acting lessons or did you take truck driving lessons <laughs> <laughs> I took acting lessons I didn't listen to them what did they think? I mean, when you were at Carnegie Tech, did you want to be an actor? Yeah, I went there. I took acting. What happened was I, I was raised in an Italian neighborhood, so I had that Italian accent, and I always talk with my hands. And I said, hey, forget about it, that kind of thing. So I was called a gangster in school. And the kids called me the gangster. But uh, I developed a certain style, and then I... I thought you, one, of, one of the things in your book, Tony and me, says, if I ever told him that I wanted to be an actor in my neighborhood, it would have been suicide. Oh, it would have been terrible. <laughs> in fact, I did lie. I told him I went to college to become an electrical engineer. Oh, that was okay. And one day the fuse went out in the barber shop, and they said, don't worry, Jacob will fix it. <laughs> and I didn't know how. So that's what I told them. They said, Clark Gable. Oh, they really ridiculed me. Afterwards, it. though, yeah. they probably were so oh, happy to know you. And they were very, very supportive. Yeah. Anybody else said it, made fun of me, they they nailed them. They go for but, it. Uh, um, one of the things that we're here, you've had a long career. We, we Everyone knows you on TV, film, stage. But nobody knows, really, a lot about your personal life yeah. and your inner soul and you've just written a book yes. and it's called Tony and Me and uh, I think it's great because it has a, oh, it's a very DVD funny, yeah. in it and they're very funny is it very good yeah. and the, the one thing that I wanted when I started reading it your your son Adam wrote this wonderful forward talking yeah. about Tony and me and saying that he bet you that if you could get everything together, that he that you'd that he'd help you write the book, yeah. and you said, okay, yes. and he thought it would never happen. No, because I was not organized. <laughs> Is that but it? You were the real Oscar. But I, I felt such a, a <laughs> love for Tony, and I wanted to, this is a tribute to him. I published it myself. I lost a lot of money because. I wanted it to be exactly the way I wanted it to be, a tribute to Tony, because I didn't know how much I missed him. 
Yeah, and what he what he said was by losing the bet, he obviously lost the bet because you got everything yeah. together. By losing the bet, it was a wonderful thing for everyone in the world because now they get to know how you yeah. feel. Well, uh, contrary to what why I love Tony Hill, he was a well-rounded guy. You could, we were on tour four, four years in a row. We did the Odd Couple to play. <laughs> and he would take me into a, mu a museum. And in two hours, I would learn more than I would learn in four days at Duluth. And then on the way home in a cab, he'd tell me the best dirty joke you ever heard. So he was able to be around. He was uh, both and sides. And his laugh was so infectious. I loved his laugh. When, why did you actually write it then? What, what were your reasons other than your love for Tony? I wanted at first I wanted to tell the world how wonderful he was. They didn't seem to realize how good he was. But they what about Jack Klugman? Oh, who was so close to him. It's not about Jack Klugman, no, really. No, it's about him. It, it was a tribute to Tony. That's all I wanted to write about. And when I and I I went to New York when he was in the hospital and I substituted for him. They gave an award and I took accepted for him. I was the host at the party he ran for his theater. And I thought they treated him very badly. So I would visit him every day and I would give him support. And I loved him. And we talked about how important we were to each other. But I, till I lost him, then I realized how much he meant to me. And I had, the only thing I could do was write a book. So one of the conclusions then that you came to was how much you missed him, oh, right? Oh, God, I missed him very, very Did you much. find other things while you were writing the book, like it, within yourself? Not about myself, but I would find about, within him. Yeah. And uh, I would remember things he would say that were so memorable and so important. I really adored him. You know, he was a sweet guy. When you uh, publish the book, which you can buy online, yeah, I know, yeah. you can buy it online, but um, is it easier to self-publish? You had to find the person oh. who wrote it. Get, the um, book Burton business. Rocks. The, well, he's a wonderful guy. He helped me very, very much. But the book business is uh, worse than anything. It's, there are like 197,000 books published every year. So it's very difficult to publish. So, so Burton Rocks, who wrote... He wrote with me. Wrote with you. When This is a different kind of a book. When you read it, it sounds just like Jack Klugman is talking. It is I me. noticed it, it was all about the way you were talking, which sometimes you don't get when someone's co collaborating with you. Well, I didn't really. What he did mostly was uh, kind of check what I had written. He proofread oh, mostly. It? Mostly, but he was very good. He was very, very important to me. When we were, we were talking about the. Uh, odd couple, oh. and I love one of the stories where Gary Marsh, where you and Tony arrive with Gary yeah. Marshall in New York, and you're both in the same limousine. Tell and that I, story. <laughs> and I was smoking, and he said, "You, you can't smoke in here." I said, "Why? I smoke. I smoke. I want to smoke." So he got out of the car, and he said, "I can't work with this guy." And I got out the other side. I said, "I can't work with him." He didn't tell me I can't smoke. And, and so Gary there's Marshall Gary. Said, Gary Marshall said, "We'll get two limos. That's all." <laughs> He's standing there like the two stars of his yeah. show are both telling him I'm quitting, right? But Gary Marshall was the best, the best. And he was very new. You uh, talk about how young he was uh, and how he hadn't done anything before. And, and he's got these two guys. Did you know Tony before you started that? I did a show with him in 1954. We did a show, a terrible show called Appointment with Adventure. It was a summer replacement for a good show. And it was terrible. We, but we played the <laughs> same thing. We played... I was a gangster, he was a professor, and we both loved to cook. So that was what it was about. But uh, it was a terrible show, terrible. But so you weren't really <laughs> buddies when you got in that, that limousine I, to no. go do this show but together. I had seen him in Mr. Peepers, oh, and right. I respected him. Right. He was so good in that show. He, was, he walked that fine line between being gay and being uh, bossy. You know, he, he was wonderful, he was just a wonderful guy. And uh, so I knew about him, and then I didn't see him from 1954 to 1970. Oh, that was a long time. Yeah, it was a long time. So you were, I mean, practically newcomers to each other. Yeah. And for him to just blow his stack and get out and say, I can't stay oh. in the car, I smell, he's smoking. Uh, he's all, he says, he my clothes smell. He's terrible about smoking. He was <laughs> terrible about it. And he used to be a smoker years and years ago. And his wife smoked. Oh, But she had you... to smoke outside. 
She couldn't smoke like on the terrace. She couldn't smoke in the house. But that was very far advanced at that time yes, to yes. say, go outside yes. and smoke, and I don't want someone yeah. to smoke. Oh, yeah. But you've been a no smoking advocate for how many years? Well, I've lost my voice as a result of it. But I'm glad, in a way, I, I wish I hadn't lost my voice. But I'm glad I did because I do theater now. I can't do television. I don't do much. Tell, they took part of your vocal cord. They cords. took my right vocal cord out. It it's doesn't. But the amazing thing is how somebody came to you and found a way for you to find your voice. Well, yeah, there was a guy who, was, who I did an interview because they said I was dying and I wasn't dying. So he said, "I think I can help you." I said, "Are you a doctor?" He said, "No." I he said. So I went to. He said, "What do you got to lose?" So I went to his place and he gave me really hard exercises, very very difficult ones. To say like scream, that? scream, you e scream. So I, he said, I, and I had no voice at all. I, Just which, silent when you'd well, scream. E oh. He said, I think I hear a sound. I said, I think you hear money. <laughs> <laughs> but I went to him, and he gave me a little voice. And then Tony Randall called and said, Okay, I have a venue for you. If we could do one performance of the Odd Couple, I could raise a million dollars. So, you know, he was the first one to visit me when I had the operation. And he said... Because you'd been working together yeah. for, what, four or five years yeah, then? I said, yeah, I lost my voice. He said, let's face it, Jackie never did sound like Richard Burton anyway. <laughs> but when he left, he said, if and when you want to come back, we'll find a venue for you. And he did. So he did. And one of the things in, in Tony and Me that you do, a portion of this is going to his National Actors, Actors Theater. Theater. Yes. Which he really put a lot of money oh, into it, a lot of time. He lost eight million dollars. He put into it. And, and what did you do with them? Why are you still close to the? Well, it's kind of disintegrated now because he's gone. But why did three men on the horse? Oh, there was a lot of yeah. great uh, theater with them, right? No, he did a lot of theater and good theater. And on Wednesdays, he would invite kids from high schools all over that couldn't afford it for nothing. It cost him thirty-five thousand dollars. But he, was, he said, I want kids to see good theater. Oh, he wanted to introduce yeah. kids to theater. Yeah, that's right. And he, he was wonderful that way. And he did uh, uh, good plays, you know, plays, classic plays. He did uh, Shakespeare. He did uh, uh, St. Joan. He did a lot of good plays. Cool. And, and since you've been doing, since <clears throat> you've been back and on the stage, and you were doing a one-person show. Yeah, I do. Oh. Is it show. your own life? Yeah, it's about Tell my us life. what it is a little bit, because well, I, what's it called? It's, well, it's called An Evening with Jack Klugman. And uh, yeah, Gary, I was talking to him, and I was telling him all the people I worked with, Bobby Bogart and Lauren McCall and Ethel Merman. He said, write down all the celebrities you worked with. Well, even I was impressed. Henry Fonda and <laughs> you know, so many of them. So uh, he said, drive here. So I did a one-man show. So you wrote theater. down the names? I wrote down the names, and then I thought of all the incidents in which I learned from them. I learned a lot from Henry Fonda. He's the best actor I ever worked with. Not one of the best, but the best I ever worked with. And why? Because he, he didn't know how to lie. He'd look you in the eye, and he would tell you the truth. And it was inspiring. He wrap you in his concentration, like uh, Kim Stanley did. Same thing? Yeah, I studied with Kim Stanley. As we studied... We well, we didn't get into that. I was going to ask you if you studied acting. I, I thought you were oh, taking yeah. truck driving lessons, no, no, but you no, were no. taking acting lessons to, all the way along. I went to American Theater, and I stayed with Lee Strasberg for three years. Oh, you did? Privately. So you, I couldn't get in the studio. I auditioned five times, couldn't get in. Did you still hire him separately? <laughs> so I went separate. But then when you went on stage, what did you do with these actors? Did you name the actors and then talk about well, them? Well, they were they questions and answers. They would ask me about... And Charlie, like I lived with Charlie Bronson for two years. Uh -huh. We lived in one room on 113th Street in New York, $7 a week. And I talked about Charlie. I met him in Atlantic City, oh. and, uh, and we were very friendly. And he, he was the one that got me in good shape, got me to exercise. And I got my first job, Mr. Roberts, because I was in good shape because of Charlie. So, so isn't that a book? No, no, no. Oh, yes, yes, no, yes. No more books. Yes. I will not write any more books. We're going to call Adam, your son, no. and say, this is the next book, your one-man show. No, no. So the, thank you so much for being oh, with us it's today. Over, it's over. Right? It's over. It's so fast. Oh, but we'll be back with Kevin Early and take Jack Klugman's book and read it because it's fabulous. You can get it online. <laughs> Hi.
Hi, I'm Joan Quinn, and welcome back to the Joan Quinn Profiles. I'm here with singer-performer Kevin Early, who was born in the suburbs of Chicago, graduated from the College, uh, college of the Lake County, and earned a Bachelor of Fine Arts in Musical Theater at Webster Conservatory in St. Louis. Kevin was on Broadway in Thoroughly Modern Millie in Les Miserables. He joined the tour of Les Miserables, and when it played in Los Angeles at the Amundsen, Guess what? He defected. <laughs> he got off. <laughs> he got off the boat and stayed. Why did you do that? I, uh, you know, um, my wife and I needed a little bit of a change, so we decided to move out here to Los Angeles. And uh, the weather was unbeatable uh, from New York uh, and from Chicago. And, and we stayed out here, and we're having a great time. Is she in uh, the theater, too? Uh, my wife, Julianne Emery, is uh, an actress. She's been doing uh, TV she? film stuff out here. Uh, that one of the reasons we, we moved out here was so that she could really pursue that so aspect of her So both of you. Yeah. So we've seen you. I saw you in Can Can at the Pasadena Playhouse. Sleeping Beauty Wakes at the Kirk Douglas yeah. Theater. And wait, I saw the other one uh, at the Kodak, the Ten Commandments. The Ten Commandments. So I've seen you a lot. Yeah. And you didn't even know it. I didn't even know you saw me. <laughs> so when you when you got off the boat, when yeah. you got off the Les Mis. Yes, the Les Mis tour. You started doing all these things here? Yeah, it's been a really great experience here. We've been here for about six years now, and um, it's really been, uh, you know, kind of working steadily. There's not a lot of leading men in, who want to stay in L.A., so I, that's been to my benefit. But uh, Do we call you a tenor? Uh, lyric baritone. Lyric baritone? Lyr lyric baritone. What's the difference? <laughs> uh, it just uh, the quality, the quality of your voice. A oh. tenor has that kind of, you know, kind of high, na more, a little more nasally sound. And a baritone has that kind of richness that, that... So you're in between? So I'm a little in between. But a lyric baritone can sort of go up to those to those notes that a tenor usually sings. So did you study opera? Uh, I didn't. I wish I had a little... I wish I had a little more opera under my belt because it really is something that uh, I'd love to be able to try to plug into at some point. But I, I never really got the chance. You've been here for six years, you said, or yeah. you've been here for... Do, do you find being able to uh, get roles here easier than New York? Uh, it's interesting. I think a lot of people in New York end up, uh, if they don't get into a Broadway show, which is really, you know, quite difficult, yeah. and, and to get in one that's going to run for any length of time, a lot of people end up doing a lot of regional theater. So what's nice about staying in L.A. is it's pretty much like doing regional theater all the time. But you, uh, all but the time, you, I But see. you get to stay at home. I so see. I think if I was in New York, <laughs> I'd probably... I probably would have ended up doing a lot of uh, a lot of regional theater, and what's nice about staying here is you get you know you get the weather and you get everything. So I, I've done a lot of roles here. And you in in Chicago, you did a lot. Did yes. you do Assassins in Chicago? I did a production of Assassins at and the Apple, Tr Apple Tree Theater, which I received a Jeff Joseph Jefferson Award. You got a great award. That's such yeah. a good play. But also in Seattle, in uh, Chicago, you started in Mama's Boys. <laughs> <Mom>. <laughs> Mama's Boys. Why what you was that? I gotta bring that up, Joe. I don't know. We were in Chicago. Uh, yes. Four it, years old. I was three. I was three or four years oh old. My gosh. Mom, mom corrected me. She said it was three. Oh my and, gosh. And uh, she. Child well, genius. She was a performer, <laughs> and I have three older brothers. We're all two years apart, and I'm the youngest. And uh, she put this little red, white, and blue outfit, bowler hats, you know, kind of top hat thing together. So and cute. <laughs> and threw us out on stage singing George M. Cohan music, and 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 it was, uh, I'm sure it was really fun. I was three. I don't remember much about it. But but your mom Diane yeah. was the uh, is or was was the artistic director at the uh, Marriott what Lincoln, is it the Marriott Lincolnshire Theater in Chicago. So she was the artistic director there for about 25 years, and so I sort of grew up on that aspect in, in that aspect. Do in, you think in it business. was nepotism? Putting you on the stage? No, that was the tell me why. That was the great thing that my mom <laughs> did. She never let anybody cast me unless I was twice as good as the next person, and it really made me work a lot harder. Is that right? Yeah, she never wanted anybody at the th at her theater to ever think that I was there because of her. And, and what about the other boys? Uh, none of them actually got into the business. My brother Dave plays guitar. My brother uh -huh. Tom is a computer programmer. My brother Mark is an uh, electrician, and. Uh, all three of them decided that a stable life and having a, a steady job was a little more important. And this than was the fame and fortune. Than fame and fortune, yes. Yes, this but, was you but this was the only thing I ever wanted to do. And I, you know, I've been very, knock on all the wood you have in the room, um, 
very lucky to, to, to have had. But that was cute, I thought, that your mom did that in a very early time. And then yeah. you continued, you went to conservatory, you studied music, I mean, yeah. and, you, and to get on Broadway was a big thing. So it's that huge. was fabulous. It's huge. But the other thing, along with all this career of yours and all this good stuff for yourself, you do a lot of benefits. You, d you did some stuff for the Actors Fund in New York, was it? Yeah, um, I've done the, the, the Stages Benefit out here for a while. There's, uh, there's a couple of Broadway things called Easter Bonnet and... Oh, uh, right. Well, I didn't, yeah, that's right. They do that and they collect money they in collect the theaters, money, right? Yeah, for, <coughs> I, think it's, uh, I think they do like two months or three months of collecting money and then they do a, a benefit at the end called the Easter Bonnet and they have a, a, another event uh, out there, they have stages benefits out here that I do, which are fantastic. I really love doing them, and they're they're fairly easy for the performer. You go in, you do one song, you know, it raises money, it raises awareness, and um, and it's you're really giving back. You did something for the William uh, Holden Wildlife uh, William Holden Wildlife too, Foundation, which is great. We love Stephanie. She's yeah, great. Stephanie Powers, is, <laughs> is, she's she's fantastic. Yeah, we like her a lot. Yeah. so that's great. And you're doing another benefit, an AIDS benefit at the Ford Amphitheater. Yeah, coming up. Chess, so coming up. Yeah. September seventeenth at uh, the Ford Amphitheater. What what exactly? Have you done chess before? I've seen productions of it, but I've never actually got a chance to do it. Well, then it's not so easy, like you're saying, to do a benefit. You have to learn the whole thing yeah this this <laughs> this is a little bit different on the on the, on, on the benefit scale this we're actually going to get a week of rehearsal and actually it's um. going to be an amazing this is actually more of a production than 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 a normal benefit would have we're going to actually do a full-scale production with there's going to be um, some a great you know one piece set but it's going to have video um, a lot of t you know kind of technology kind of things with the reporters it's because ba basically the story takes place in the co sort of the Cold War. Um, it is a chess game, right? It's a chess game <laughs> between an American and a Russian, sort of during the Cold War when when Russians usually defected and all that kind of intrigue. And the reporter aspect of of the show is how it sort of through lines and what Brian Purcell, our our, our director, he's producer, directing it. He's producing it as well, Brian Purcell. Yeah, and he's put together some great video stuff that you can actually see on MySpace right now that uh, is really going to show you what what some really creative things that he's going to do with the production. When, when he does this, and since it's the first time you're ever doing chess, would you ever think of going on the road with it? I mean, would it be something that could... You know, something like that you have to get, you I do have know. to get a producer who's got, you know, a lot of connections and a lot of money. Um, you yeah, know, that's, I mean, that would be the next step if, if something like that happened. Right now we're, we're doing this benefit and putting it together and really trying to put it together well. And it's at the Ford Amphitheater is right across from the uh, Hollywood Bowl. So yes. it's in a great area. It's a great stage. Um, it's great space. Yeah, it's a really good thing. So that'll be interesting for you. Now, take the, from the Ford Amphitheater, go back to Can Can. <laughs> Tell me about that, because that just closed at the Pasadena Playhouse, yes. and that was such a fabulous production. Oh, thank it you. Was, it re, was reborn, right? It was re-envisioned, re <laughs> re as it were, by David Lee and Joel Fields, uh, keeping Cole Porter's music and keeping some of A. Burroughs' book, but they really have t they've really taken the, the, the piece and, and updated it. Um, from its original form to make it a lot more accessible, I think, to, to a lot of theaters. And Will that go on? Will um, it continue? I think, I think they have as, as many hopes. Uh, I think the production staff and the producers and the directors have, and the director, David Lee, have as much of uh, a, an aspiration to have it go somewhere forward as the, the cast you, does. Would you be in it? I mean, would they take the cast with them? That, that's always a that's always a question for the producers. You know, that's I don't know. I wonder. We would about love to. That. I don't think there's a person in the cast who would who would say that they wouldn't love to. You know, be a part of this project for for many years, uh, whether it goes to Broadway or whether it goes to a bunch of regional theaters. Um, yeah, it really is a, a fantastic show, and I think the cast was just amazing between Michelle Duffy and David Engel and just everybody had such a, a, an amazing time throughout the whole not only the rehearsal process but but the performance process. So you're finished. Yes. You're finished with Can Can. Yes. Do you take voice lessons now? Uh, I don't. What do you do I, during I, something like that? How do you keep in shape? And you're off time. Yeah I mean your, your voice is a muscle so you want to you want to keep working it and um, uh, you know, singing in the car and the, with the <laughs> oh, radio. Oh, please. Uh, and on a, on a CD. On a CD, yeah. My wife and I actually produced this CD called Early Standards. We produced it about uh, three or four years ago, and it's selling well. We've, we've Tell us uh, who some of the, the those 
Uh, this is standard. Authors it's, are it's, writers. It's like, it's Duke Ellington. Duke Ellington, um, Cole Porter, uh, George Gershwin. Uh, who else is on there? Uh, Harold Garner. Ha Harold Garner. It's it's basically all your standards. Like I've got you under my skin. Old Devil Moon. Uh, do you fly me to the moon. Do you play an instrument? I, I don't. I'm just the vocalist on this. Uh, Jerry Sternbach was our, our our pianist and musical director, and a great great bunch of musicians, Michael Frantuno, who plays bass, who is an original member of the Black Eyed Peas. So oh, it's so kind of an eclectic group of people. Yeah. But um, really was a fun project to do, uh, and uh, it's it's selling pretty well. You can get it on CDBaby.com. When you when you do, and Chess is, Chess, you, right, you can go to the Ford Ampa, uh, no, right. Ford Theaters dot org. Because it's a charity night. Yeah, it's it's going to be a, a, a Ford Theaters yeah, is, it's, it's selling a, the tickets. Right. Um, do you take dancing lessons in between? Uh, I study. <laughs> I, I, I study all my dance at Webster University in St. Louis, and um, right now I just you know I study for shows. I don't, I don't do a lot of dancing. But you lately, had a but really fabulous choreographer in Can Can. Yes. So was it easy to follow uh, the steps? Uh, she was amazing. What she w what she did really well with the people who move really well is 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 worked with us and, and, and creating something that looked good on us but wasn't too complicated. So, I mean, the, the, but the girls in, in the can-can yeah. were uh, just... They were great. It's, it's astounding what they do every night, sometimes twice it, in yeah. a night on Saturdays. It, it was really uh, astounding what they do. But, but that's like, for, for you, I would think, going to the gym, working, doing some kind yeah. of, you have to have some kind of aerobics. Uh, yeah. <laughs> uh, as, as a performer, you, you, you know, you got to work out and you got to train and you got to, as any kind of, you know, actor knows, you got to keep in shape, uh, whatever shape that is, uh, for your, you know, particular style. So, yeah, I, I, I work out and, and I, I'll work on, you know, CDs or I'll work on different music at home if I'm not, if I'm not in a show or something like that. I will definitely be at home at my piano practicing something. Good. Yeah. <laughs> Good. Thanks, working. Kevin. I'm constantly working on something. <laughs> thanks very much. Thank you. And thanks for watching the Joan Quinn Profiles. Keep writing to 777 South Figueroa, 44th floor, Los Angeles, 90017.